This NAS is old. And I don't think I'm exaggerating that much because when this thing first came out, I didn't even have a driver's license yet. It uses deprecated protocols, is plagued with vulnerabilities, and was made by Netgear? But as surprising as it may seem, this little old NAS isn't dead just yet. I'm not dead! In this video, I'm going to explore multiple ways to breathe some life back into this thing. Some solutions are fairly easy, while others, well, might get a little bit hacky. Let's get started. Now, really quick, I'd like to point out that this video doesn't need a sponsor, thanks to my amazing raid members. If you like the videos I make and want to help support me and help me keep the lights on without having to run so many ads, maybe consider becoming a raid member yourself. For as little as a dollar a month, you get early access to videos, behind the scenes content, and some other cool perks. So maybe consider becoming a raid member either on Patreon or here on YouTube as a member. All right, back to the video. This is the ReadyNAS Pro 2 from Netgear. And yeah, Netgear actually at one point made NAS appliances. Who knew? Now it's possible you've actually seen this already if you watched the $200 Home Lab series. If you haven't, go check that out because it was a lot of fun. But this was the exact same NAS Brett over at Radal picked up in his part two video, and I was intrigued and asked if Brett would send it over, and he did, so thanks Brett. Based on one of the manuals I found online, I believe this was released back in 2011, which means if it were a child, it would be in middle school already. So why the heck am I talking about this thing? Well, this is Hardware Haven, so if you've watched my channel, you're probably like, yeah, of course you're talking about this thing. But really, it's because I've come across quite a few of these NAS appliances from brands that aren't really relevant today, like Netgear. I've always wondered if these could still be useful somehow. I mean, it is nice at times just to have a simple two-bay NAS. Obviously, the biggest issue with something like this is going to be software support, or the lack thereof. Not only will you be missing modern features, but you'll also have to deal with outdated protocols and unpatched security vulnerabilities. But I hate seeing stuff like this end up in a landfill just because of software issues, so I set out to see what could be done with it. Ideally, you could just install something like TrueNAS and call it a day, but, well, you might have noticed that this doesn't have any sort of display output. Due to that, and not knowing if there was any way to realistically install some third-party software, I also decided it would be worth it to see if there was anything that could be done with the first-party software to somewhat modernize it. But before getting into that, let's just see what we're working with here. The ReadyNAS Pro 2 features an Intel Atom D525. This is a dual-core 4-thread CPU released in 2010 with a 13-watt TDP and clock speed of 1.8 GHz. It also has 1 GB of DDR3 SOTA memory, and a small onboard flash module that's just used as a bootloader and to install the operating system onto the hard drives. Speaking of which, it obviously has two 3.5 inch hot swappable SATA drive bays, which are behind this cute little door. On the front, there's also a power and backup button, as well as a single USB 3 port. On the back, there are two USB 2 ports, two gigabit ethernet ports, a DC barrel jack, reset button, and this piece of tape, which actually comes into play a little bit later on. I didn't exactly know what state this system was in, so I hooked it up to my network and powered it on. I used Netgear's radar software to locate it, and it showed up as Grandpa Naz, which is exactly the name I would expect from Radal. Obviously, I had no idea what the login info was, so I resorted to a factory reset. To do that, you use a pin to hold down the reset button on the back while you power it on, and then cycle through these different combinations of LEDs using the backup button. I selected the LED combo for factory reset, and then pressed the reset button on the back again. It showed up in radar again, but this time had a drive error. So I replaced the bad drive with a random one terabyte drive I had, and the install worked. I tried to log into the admin panel, but that failed. It turns out this is still using TLS version 1, which no modern operating system is going to support. Fortunately, using Firefox, I was able to set the minimum TLS version to 1, and then I could get into the admin page. The setup wizard, while a bit archaic looking, was fairly typical, and I set up the network settings, RAID array, volumes, users, etc., and then gave this little underdog of a NAS a fitting host name. Once everything was set up, I tried connecting to an SMB share in Windows, but that didn't work, and I had an idea of why. My guess was that this old NAS was still using SMB version 1, which isn't supported by default in Windows. You can, however, turn that on, and after activating support for SMB version 1, my share showed up and I could use my NAS as normal, and I was actually getting pretty decent performance over a gigabit connection. Using an outdated and insecure protocol isn't a good long-term solution, though, so I started digging through some forums and eventually came across this wiki from someone named Edgar. Big shout out to Edgar. 
To do this fix, I needed SSH, which wasn't available by default. But you can download an add-on and then manually upload it to the admin panel and install it. After that, I could SSH into the NAS and configure Samba. However, the smb.conf file gets rewritten on startup, so I followed Edgar's advice and copied these lines to another file at slash etc slash blah 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 slash addons.conf to enable SMB version 2 and then restarted the system. After a reboot, I could see those changes now in the actual smb.conf file, and after disabling SMB version 1 in Windows, I could still access the NAS, meaning we were now using SMB version 2. That in and of itself is pretty huge and means this NAS could actually be useful as a little backup server or something. For being over a decade old, the system power draw wasn't that bad, sitting at around 26 watts. With the hard drive spun down, the power draw dropped down to around 18 watts. Now really quick, I always think it's a good idea to only run a NAS on your local network and never expose it to the web in any way. And that is definitely the case with this thing. I mean, the web UI for example is still a massive security risk. and. I didn't want that to be the end of the road for this guy. So I kept digging and fortunately came across an even better solution. But before getting into that, I wanted to tear this guy down and get it cleaned up. I mean, it might actually be useful now, so we don't want it to be all gross and dusty. The teardown was fairly easy with just a few screws holding in all the various panels. While I was tearing everything down, I decided to try and upgrade the RAM, which was really easy to get to. I tried upgrading to a 4GB stick of DDR3, but the system wouldn't post. The CPU is listed as being able to support 4GB of RAM, but I came across a few people saying that it could only support 2GB per socket, but it only has a single memory channel, so I don't really know if that's correct. If you guys know for some reason, let me know in the comments below. That being said, I tried multiple different 4GB sticks that I had with no luck. And surprisingly, I couldn't find a single 2GB stick to try, so I sadly just had to stick with the 1GB of DDR3. The design was fairly simple with a central chassis covered in side, top, and back panels, and then two daughter boards for the IO and SATA backplane that were both connected to the main motherboard. With it all taken apart, I dusted everything off and wiped down all the components with isopropyl alcohol. With just a little bit of elbow grease, it was looking pretty good. But I didn't just want it to look good, I wanted it to be useful, so I got back to upgrading the software. The Ready NAS Pro 2 runs an operating system from Netgear called Radiator. They really liked the RAID branding on everything. However, it seems that at some point, some really smart people figured out a way to upgrade the ReadyNAS Pro 2 and other similar models to a much newer version of Netgear's operating system called, well, ReadyNAS OS. I actually found multiple good guides on how to do this update, which had me download two different binaries. One was actually just an add-on that you uploaded to the NAS to prep it for the actual update. The second binary was the actual update that I uploaded to the admin panel as a standard firmware update. After hitting the install button and sweating for a few minutes, it popped back up in Radar with firmware version 6. The new admin panel in Setup Wizard not only looked more modern, but it also supported a newer TLS version, meaning it didn't have any issues loading in a modern web browser. I set up all of my volumes, shares, etc. without any issues, and SMB version 3 was actually supported out of the box with no need for weird hacks or anything. The web UI was much better on the eyes, and I got pretty excited when I started looking through the apps list and came across Docker and even Portainer. Sadly, my excitement was quickly squashed when I couldn't get anything to install. I was prompted to update to a newer firmware version, and I was sort of hopeful that this might fix the issue and let me install something like Portainer. Sadly, it kind of had the opposite effect. I'm pretty sure the main point of this last release was to just get rid of all of the app options since they weren't maintained anymore. So sadly, the ability to run Docker or other services wasn't really going to be an option, at least not without some more hackiness. I still had SSH access with the new firmware, which was actually just built on top of Debian 8 Jesse. I could have tried working with that, but Debian 8 hasn't been supported for a long time now. So instead, I just got crazy and attempted to update from Debian 8 up to Debian 10, which still has long-term support. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to just update one version at a time, but I decided to just send it and go straight to Debian 10. I had to do a lot of tinkering and troubleshooting, but I eventually managed to upgrade to Debian 10. I decided to get even more crazy and upgrade to Debian 11, and decided to get rid of Netgear's repositories for the ReadyNAS. This meant that essentially all of the ReadyNAS features got completely wiped, including SMB shares, but I actually did manage to get Debian 11 installed. The fun was short-lived though as it didn't survive through a reboot, which I sort of expected. I'm sure it's possible you could configure Grub to work properly and make this solution work, but I didn't, and sadly, the underdog NAS was never seen again.
Well, not really. I went back to the boot menu thing again by holding down the reset button when I powered it on, but this time I selected the option to reinstall the OS from the internal storage. This worked as expected, but what wasn't expected was that it actually installed the newer ReadyNAS OS. I guess this was flashed to the internal storage whenever we did the update, so the underdog NAS lives on. Having Debian running for about an hour or two really made me want to try to get a third-party operating system on this thing. But like I mentioned earlier, there is no HDMI or VGA output. There is that little piece of tape though, and more importantly, behind that little piece of tape is a 4-pin header for a serial connection. Now I basically know nothing about serial or TTL or UART or anything in that world, but I was dead set on getting another operating system installed on this thing. So I just sort of awkwardly stumbled forward and bought two of these little USB to TTL serial adapters. I bought two because I figured they were pretty cheap and there was a good chance I would find a way to break one of them. I had to extrapolate a lot of info using a few different blog posts and guides from other Netgear NAS models, but I felt pretty confident as to which pins did what. I plugged in the transmit wire from the USB adapter to the receive pin, the receive wire to the transmit pin, and originally I wasn't sure about the power or ground pins, but I eventually also plugged in the ground wire as well. I plugged the USB adapter into my laptop, which was running Linux Mint, and installed something called Minicom. After some trial and error, I managed to actually get a readout on the screen, and even got to the BIOS. To do this, I needed a baud rate of 9600, 8 data bits, no parity, and one stop bit. I also turned hardware flow control off. I originally planned to install TrueNAS, but with only 1GB of VDR3, I figured that might not be the best solution, so I just landed on a plain old Debian 12 install. I plugged in the Debian install media, as well as a 2.5 inch SSD using a USB adapter. Thanks to a few of the guides I was following, I found that you could hold down the backup button while powering the system on to boot from USB. And it seemed to be trying to do that as I would get a flashing light on the USB, but I would still just get a blinking cursor in Minicom. After a lot of digging, trial and error, and mostly just help from Apollard's Adventures, I finally got it working. Seriously, I have to give a huge shout out to Apollard's Adventures because I probably wouldn't have gotten to the Debian install menu if it wasn't for his help. If you like this channel, I'd be surprised if you didn't like his channel because he tinkers with a lot of cool old hardware and does cool projects, but he is way smarter than I am, so seriously, go subscribe, go check out his channel. I'll have a link down in the description or on a card thing up here somewhere, so go do it. I'm not kidding. Go. There's probably a better and more correct way to do this, but what I found worked for me was to actually edit a few files on the actual install media. In the file at slash isolinux slash isolinux.config, I added serial 0, 115, 200, 0 on the top line, and then console 0 right underneath that. Basically what I understand is this is telling the bootloader to not use a normal VGA header for the console, but to instead use the serial connection and to use a baud rate of 115,200. I also typed in console equals ttys0, 115,200 in 8, here in slash iso linux slash txt config. I'm pretty sure here basically we're telling the standard install option for the Debian installer to also use serial instead of a normal VGA output. In Minicom, I switched the baud rate to 115,200, and the Debian installer window showed up. I pressed tab here on the install window just to confirm the boot options that I put in earlier, and then proceeded with the install like normal. After a very long install process, I actually got Debian installed with no real issues. I was able to access it over SSH, and even got crazy enough to install Casa OS, which worked. I decided to push this thing really far and install Crafty Controller to run a Minecraft server, but that was definitely pushing things too far as it just failed to start up. I'm not sure if this was a limitation of the 1GB of DDR3 or just a decade old Atom CPU. Now, one important thing to note is that if the system ever shuts down, you'll have to hold down that backup button to make sure it boots back into the USB SSD. When I was installing Debian and had the option to install the Grub bootloader, I probably could have selected the internal flash module to fix this issue. However, that flash module contained the only image I had of the ReadyNAS OS, and I didn't want to wipe that. But hey, I got a modern operating system on a 13 year old or so NAS, and I was pretty happy with that. Whether just tweaking the original operating system, upgrading to a newer version, or just completely installing something else, it's cool to see something like this old 2-bay NAS actually still have some life in it. If you just need a simple 2-bay NAS, or you want another NAS to have a local or off-site backup, this actually isn't the worst solution, especially if you tweak some of the power settings to, for example, only have this power on for days when you want to run backups or something. 
I think what I find most awesome though are all the smart people that actually make stuff like this happen. I did some things while doing this video, but really I was just following in the footsteps and advice of other much smarter people like Apollard's Adventures, for example. Seriously, go subscribe, it's awesome. If you liked this video, maybe give me a like or comment down below. Maybe let me know what you would do with something like this, Naz, or maybe tell me about a story of something you did that was similar. I always love to hear those. Also, once again, if you wanna help support the channel, maybe consider becoming a raid member. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.